to the Berkhampton Commission on Disabilities. This meeting is being videotaped and audio recorded. And um, I, as the chair, I would like to ask that during, during this meeting, for all our meetings actually, but just a reminder, that um, when we go through the agenda, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Patty will, Patty will let me know. Um, if someone is raising their hand and then you'll be called on and that way we can all be mindful of each other and make sure that everyone has a chance to say what they need to say okay so we will um we'll start with introductions we can just go around the room quickly and say um who we are and i will start i'm tori eplin and i'm the chair of the commission and we'll go this way hi i'm hannah coyle i'm vice chair of the commission Martin Nagy, member. I'm Jim Winstead, a member of the Commission of Disability Attorneys. My name is Craig Pierwash. I'm on the panel with the Northampton Police Department. Hi, Jim. My name is Chris North. I'm a Deputy Fire Chief with the City of Northampton. I'm Brian Duggan. I'm the Fire Chief and Emergency Manager for the City of Northampton. City Councilor Marianne LaBarge. Pat Thomas, Senior Center Director and ADA Coordinator. Great. The next item is public comment. Do we have any public comment from members of the public? We do have a member of the public. I'm not sure he's here to comment, except maybe he could just be introduced. Oh. Uh, yeah, in the back is actually my father, Paul Duggan, uh, who is an East Hampton resident. Oh, <laughs> welcome. welcome. Glad to have you. Hello. OK. Um, so can we quickly? Before we begin with our guests, can we have um, a motion to approve the, meet, the minutes for November 18th? Motion to approve them. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. So um, we have three guests today. Welcome and thank you all so much for coming. And um, you all have introduced yourselves, so we all we all know one another. And um, some questions came up at our last meeting that we thought it would be helpful to have all of you answer for us. And um, I'm going to let Hannah do the bulk of, lead the bulk of this discussion because she's the one that had the issues. And then um, I have something that I would like to ask after Hannah's finished with her, um, her questions. So, great, Hannah. Um. There have been repeated instances of people being unnecessarily removed from their apartments because someone, um, for instance, a neighbor, might make a fraudulent call to um, a police or ambulance department. And um, I would like to work on reducing the number of fraudulent calls and the, un um, the amount of unnecessary visits to hospitals. So Hannah, I'll start off uh, by addressing that. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, we work hand in hand with Lieutenant Kerouac and the police department on every response. And I think we'll both get into some specifics relative to that. Deputy Chief Norris to my left is the emergency medical services uh, deputy for our fire rescue department mm -hmm. and can sort of go into the specifics. Certainly, if we receive a call through our 911 center, we have an obligation to respond to that call. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have an obligation to evaluate the person that needs aid, or potentially may need aid, whether that's someone that, that just to knock on the door and check that a neighbor is conscious and not in trouble, or something like that. Uh, beyond that, there are very specific sort of rules of engagement almost of how we treat patients. Uh, if we don't follow those rules of engagement, uh, it's actually considered abandonment. Uh, and then there are other things where someone truly needs attention and is a legal process for that. So first, I'm going to turn to my left and, and ask Deputy Chief Norris to just go through sort of the different types of consent when someone calls. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then we can hear from uh, Lieutenant Kerouac relative to uh, what's called a section 12. Mm -hmm. okay. I agree. Um, so uh, essentially, anytime we get called to any address, uh, the members will arrive on scene and they'll basically do a assessment of the patient we've gotten called to. Mm -hmm. um, 
when we go to any address, once that assessment is completed, the individuals ultimately have the right to either consent to allow us to continue medical treatment and transport. They have the ability to um, not go or sign a patient refusal as long as they're conscious, alert, and orientated, and of at least uh, 18 years of age in the state of Massachusetts, which is considered an adult. Mm -hmm. um, they, if anyone calls out of concern for their health and well-being, and we complete that assessment, we determine that they are conscious, alert, orientated, they're adult age, um, and they choose not to go, they uh, have that right, and that happens about 20% of our calls throughout the year actually are refusal type calls. Um, another situation sometimes we run into is we'll go in to a medical emergency. The individual may be unconscious. And in the state of Massachusetts, we actually, there's, uh, there's a lot that's about uh, implied consent. And essentially what that means is it's kind of understood that if um, the individual can't respond or unconscious or responsive, it's implied that they would want us to continue to care for them and treat and transport to the appropriate medical facility. Mm -hmm. And then the final one is, that we run into from time to time is the Section 12. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we work hand in hand with the police department, um, some of the behavioral health centers uh, throughout the community, um, some of the physicians, um, in regards to trying to determine whether an individual is a harm to their self or others. Mm -hmm. Yes, a little bit. Um, under Mass General Law 1.3, Section 12, we have the ability to sign a paper to get somebody involuntarily transferred to a medical facility for further evaluation. That's essentially what the Section 12 does. It gets the person from their home into a medical facility to be examined by a doctor and or and or mental health professional. Who has to sign the section as well? A medical doctor can sign it. Some licensed social workers, I believe, and I'd have to double check that. I didn't bring one because I wasn't. I think a clinical sure. psychologist can sign it, right? A PhD psychologist? And a, and a psychiatrist. And a psychiatrist, I think. Which psychiatrist would call you the medical. Yeah. And the police have the authority. The police to, can do it, right? Yeah. It, yes. Um, as a matter of protocol, because we have mental health facilities and, <coughs> and clinical and support options and a hospital in town, as a matter of protocol, we don't often do them. We don't often sign them, except for very dire circumstances where we intervened with an active, you know, person trying to harm themselves or actively restrain them, then under those circumstances we would probably do it. In the more static situation, we will we relay a lot of information over the telephone to clinical and support options. Mm -hmm. And their doctor, they'll actually make a call for their psychiatrist and they will sign, they will issue the section 12 vaccine to us. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the things that, that our people encounter um, are pretty dramatic. Uh, to the point that we may need a police officer to help us in the back of the ambulance or to go to the hospital. Uh, and, and again, I think uh, the city would really be proud to understand how well fire rescue and police work together on these calls, that pretty much every medical call there is a police presence and, and is at least the ambulance crew. And when you get to a car accident or more serious calls, there's a whole team of people that really combine efforts to treat that patient well. I think I think you mentioned that, that the police were acting on the word of another mm -hmm. um, in certain circumstances. I think that would, that would initiate our response there, but we would actually, you know, use our own observations through questioning and the fire department jointly to determine what's, what's going on. We just wouldn't take somebody's word and say, you know, so-and-so said this person's a problem. We would go in there and take them out of their house. That, that it really isn't how it would work. Mm -hmm. um, if there was, some, uh, oftentimes there's history with, with certain people, so we know them, mm -hmm. the fire department and ambulance personnel knows them, 
the mental health clinical and support options, knows them, or emergency services. So we, you know, we make these calls and we get the information that we, we've observed and seen and gathered from, from different sources to make you know, a reasoned decision on it. Okay. Patty, you have a question? Yep. Um, so if somebody's calling in um, to 911, do they have to give their name? I know that their phone number is going to show up, right? But do they have to identify themselves in order to they don't have make to identify, no. They don't have to identify themselves. Mm -hmm. they, they can call. It. I mean, we always, the emergency dispatchers always ask as a matter of routine. That's one, you know, mm -hmm. what's your name, what's your address, what's your phone number? Mm -hmm. um, but very often people will call and say, you know, I don't want to be known, but I have this information I want. And we, mm -hmm. you know, we obviously respect mm -hmm. that. So, yeah. how many how many people have approached you about concerns of a neighbor calling dispatch mm -hmm. of going to a residence home? Mm -hmm. How many people have approached you on that? Well, there it's um, there's been a few instances of this, and I'm just concerned because I don't want this to to keep happening. Um, you know, I, um, if if there's somebody that gets a Section 12 but doesn't often visit the person but still gets a Section 12 for that person, um, it, it, that can, that is, my concern is there's some, there's, if someone is possibly in, um, when they might have a medical situation. Sometimes the medical situation can be solved at home and a hospital is not needed. And if somebody does get a Section 12 but isn't, you know, hasn't seen that person in a while and gets that Section 12, a past experience has been that the person is still required to go to the hospital, but yet today um, I find out that there's, uh, that um, a patient can sign a refusal, but that, is that only with your department or is that also true with the police department? Uh, Deputy Chief Norris was speaking of an initial contact when there is not a Section 12 in place. If there's a Section 12 in place, you do not have the right to refuse. We have to take one out. That, that, that's an order under the law signed by a doctor, and, and you are obligated by the law to bring that person before the hospital. And Hannah, to clarify, so, so let's sort of walk through this from the beginning, that someone places a 911 call. Mm -hmm. If you put yourself in that dispatcher's shoes, the dispatcher tries to do a lot of things. One is provide some instruction to people to help someone prior to our people getting there. Mm -hmm. but. It is an obligation once we receive a report, whether it's with a name or anonymous, uh, through Enhanced 911, we get some information on location, uh, mm -hmm. but we have an obligation to respond to investigate the situation. And then at that point, absent a Section 12 or person being unconscious implied consent, people can refuse. And you mentioned sort of a Section 12. A neighbor can't issue a Section 12 on someone. It's only sort of a licensed professional that can issue that Section 12. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? Oh, uh, yes, yes, okay. I understand that. I guess my concern is that um, what, if, what if the person who, who signs for the Section 12 has never met the person who signs? You know, if this person signs for the Section 12, but yet has never met the person that they want to bring to the hospital. Um, that is a concern. I guess I was hoping for something where um, individuals could possibly be given a telephone number so that they could call um, either someone like a pre-hospital liaison um, and let them know that they are okay and that they don't need to go to the hospital. 
um, or if they could be given the phone number to the police or ambulance dispatchers and also affirm that they are okay and do not need to go to the hospital, that that would be something that would be able to help, um, be of help. Um, I truly feel that um, creating an, a position like a pre-hospital liaison where someone could call and affirm that they don't need to go to the hospital would really help reduce the number of unnecessary, unnecessary visits to the hospital. Um, so that's, that's important. Um, and I guess I'm just concerned because I want to affirm that, I want to see that all individuals' rights in the community, including people with disabilities, that they are not discriminated against and taken from their apartment against their will um, when someone does sign a Section 12 and has done that repeatedly. Um, so that's a concern. That is a concern. So, Hannah, are you saying that a psychiatrist or a physician or someone who is under the law able to do a Section 12 has repeatedly um, filled these out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so some of that goes beyond what we can address. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, Lieutenant Kerouac can clarify, but if a Section 12 is issued by a psychiatrist, it's typically out of their concern that the person is going to hurt themselves or someone else. Mm -hmm. And we then have an obligation to act because we've been given that Section 12. Mm -hmm. Typically, that's also followed up and witnessed by our people as we deliver the process. Um, but I don't think we can intervene in someone that is legally able to issue a Section 12. Um, it would be better to approach the state board to revoke a psychiatrist or medical license if there's one individual that causes concern. But I don't think we can affect that change. If, mm -hmm. I'll turn it to you, Craig. To, no, I, I agree. Some of it is it's legislative mm -hmm. action. Um, Pre-Section 12, we can do some of the things you're speaking of, and we often do. Okay. Um, the city's contracted emergency service providers, clinical and support options. Mm -hmm. They're contracted to provide emergency mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. um, we go through them oftentimes for the Section 12, as I described earlier. Um, we'll also sometimes initiate a call, a call between the person we're we're speaking to and them. So sometimes that resolves situations. So the, the, those are things that in practice do sometimes happen. If, if we've engaged somebody and we think they're, you know, in some type of need for mental health services, you know, pre pre section twelve, we do sometimes you know, ask them to call clinical and support options. We'll stand by during that conversation and you know they'll say yes I think Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, I'm raising my hand for myself. Um, <laughs> just trying to set a good example. Um, so this sort of ties into this, but this was also just a question that I had wanted to ask um, while all of you are here. Um, I have a friend in another state who has numerous disabilities, and she utilizes a program that's done through their local police department. Um, it's called Are You Okay? It's a telephone mm -hmm. reassurance program. So that um, if you sign up for that program, you're called, I think she said twice a day, by someone at the police department to, and they check on her and just make sure that she's okay. And I was wondering if um, that's ever been considered in Northampton because I was thinking that perhaps that might be really helpful in helping people feel secure in their own homes and also just having sort of a well-being check might 
assist with some of that, and it could be people who have psychiatric disabilities or people who have physical disabilities where they might be at higher risk of falling or slipping or having things happen. And I, I just was wondering if that was anything that had been considered. I had never heard that I mentioned. Can, I can speak to that. Okay. Yeah, and I mentioned this at our last meeting that um, through Triad we started a program um, called a telephone reassurance program and we work with the Sheriff's Department and the DA's office um, and we set up a program that was volunteers who would um, uh, make phone calls to uh, seniors or disabled individuals on any list um, and I also had mentioned that um, we had very few people who had signed up for it, and then we had the volunteers, and we had nobody. We had like one person, and that program dissolved. Mm -hmm. um, and many communities do have it. It's called Are You Okay? And um, it is operated through a, a telephone system, you know, usually with a police department, um, mm -hmm. where the calls are <coughs> the answers, then there's a home visit made, a well-being check. Yeah. But the call comes in at a certain time every day, let's say 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. The person's not there to get the phone call, then there would be a, a, a well-being check. And, and I could share some experience with that through the chair. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, many years ago, I think coming up on 16 or 17 years ago, when I was uh, chief out east in, in the town of Northborough, the police mm -hmm. department had the RUOK system. Mm -hmm. and, and at that time, it was fairly popular and resulted in the well-being checks. Over the years, what I've seen is sort of a migration toward the home medic alert button oh, uh, right. and the ability to inter communicate through them. For example, we had uh, someone the other day that we responded to that they pressed the button. They weren't actually near the base receiver, but it was sensitive enough they could hear that the person was calling for help and had fallen. And it gives us specific information versus just sort of the unknown. But we also do get people that call and say, geez, I haven't seen mm -hmm. my friend or and so forth. So we'll do a well-being check with the police department on that as well. You would if somebody asked you to, like that? If somebody said, I'm concerned about someone? Okay, that pretty well happens every day. Well, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I know you've responded when we call. Right. His neighbors will call us and say, I haven't seen so-and-so. And then we call dispatch and mm -hmm. somebody yeah. goes out, which is very good. It's reassuring to us it's um, nice. as well. That's also, really too, the concerns are our police department is a very, very busy police department. Our fire department is also, but I would have great concerns as a city councilor of them being at the station, phone calls coming in. How would you go if you had emergencies? I have to say the fire department has worked very closely with me and the police department in Ward 6. We just did have equipment placed with a um, resident on Lowville Road, mm -hmm. and apparently the family was very concerned because it was not operable. And Brian worked very carefully with the family, and she, they had a system put in there where if something was wrong, she just had a press. That's really yeah. good. Yeah. Right. There's a number of businesses that uh, provide mm -hmm. that type of um, alert. So maybe the, the are you okay is getting sort of obsolete with right. technology yeah. and, and equipment that people can have that would accomplish the same thing and give them more autonomy over over it by <coughs> letting them use it when they need to. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So if that's yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you would like to present? Um I guess if that's what they're here for, so mm -hmm. if if um, if individuals could be given a telephone number to call the if the individuals could be given a chance to tell the police department or the ambulance department that they are okay and affirm that they are okay, even if somebody else wants a section 12, if they can be given a phone number to talk to the police department or be referred to a pre-hospital liaison or um, a phone number for a counselor um, to affirm that a hospital stay is not necessary and the person who is requesting 
to Section 12 um, might not, uh, if that person is only an acquaintance or maybe has only met that person once, um, might not know the individual as well as somebody else. Um, and I think that that might be something that possibly could be developed in the future if a phone number could be given out to individuals for a pre-hospital liaison or to be referred to a counselor instead. Um, that would be more affirming for people uh, with disabilities especially um, because um, being taken from one's apartment against one's will repeatedly um, is often due to um, someone overreacting about a situation and, um, and that's why I'm asking possibly for to be referred to, for individuals to be referred to um, a pre-hospital liaison instead. Is that something that you think um, the police department or the ambulance department might consider um, um, offering a telephone number for citizens to call um, to talk to the departments initially? Well, clinical and support options, again, is a 24-hour, you get 24-hour mental health services when, Emergency you, service. when you call them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is in place already. Mm -hmm. As far as the Section 12, it's usually, the Section 12 is not usually anybody's first course of action to, to address somebody with mental health. The last mm -hmm. resort. Mm -hmm. right. and, and those usually. only can be done by medical professionals. It's not. Right. And sometimes it's not, not first-hand information, but it's delivered through you know, credible sources about what people are hearing, seeing, I mean, to, to this medical profession. And as far as reaching out to police or fire rescue, mm -hmm. that that option is already there, that there are both, obviously 911 is the emergency number, but 587-1100 uh, is a whole cascading series of numbers that we receive multiple calls on that goes direct to the dispatcher that dispatches both fire and police. So there's a direct link there that anyone can use at any time. And just to be clear, the Section 12 doesn't necessarily hospitalize you for 48 hours. It gets you before a medical, into a medical facility for an evaluation. We often see people that, you know, there's a Section 12, the ambulance brings them up to the hospital. Within a couple hours, they're back home because, you know, they've, you know, spoken to that, that mental health professional and they've deemed that they don't need further hospitalization or they, Mm -hmm. whatever they happen to do with their medications or clarify information that was relayed, whatever mm -hmm. need, needs to be done. So really it's to, it's to get you for that professional evaluation, mm -hmm. not necessarily to hospitalize you for the, the period that can... Do you have a question? Uh, one of our goals is, is certainly to work with the community, not only to be accessible and, and provide sort of a, a high quality and high level of service in a responsive way, but, but also to work with the community to sort of minimize the call volume the council of Bar talked about. Because it is very true that we have a police department that often has to stack calls, meaning there are multiple calls that have to be prioritized. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to, to share a personal experience from fire rescue, um, I mean, we do several thousand calls per year to up to 18 communities around us because we're the receiving facility. Uh, and I had to call the other day for my mother Mm -hmm. and it was the last ambulance and last piece of fire apparatus that was available. So there was no fire apparatus available. They were already on other calls, and every other ambulance we had, other than one that came and helped her, uh, was already assigned to other calls. So it's not unusual for, on the, the fire rescue side, to have four or five calls going at the same time, and on the police side, even far more than that. Mm -hmm. How do you have a question? Um, when, when is it that, um, or who actually goes out when you get a call? Is it the ambulance, the uh, fire truck, and the police cruiser? Is it all three that go every time, or 
what, what's the situation where all three? So well, what type of cost? Well, that's what I'm saying because people will say, I don't know why the fire truck came um, because whatever. We we get that call. We get that question all the time. Um, I called for, I, I, I called for an ambulance and a fire truck showed up. Um, when the call comes in to the Northampton Communications Center. Um, all calls are triaged, um, otherwise known as emergency metro dispatch, EMD. And essentially what the dispatchers do upstairs is they sign up a letter, um, A, B, C, D, or E, uh, with E being the most severe type of calls. So essentially, um, the 25% of the most severe type calls, the chest pains, the difficulty breathing, the anaphylactic reaction, more vehicle accidents, things of those nature, that's when you get the firemen to respond um, for a number of reasons. Um, number one, to uh, make sure that we get the quickest unit there um, as quickly as possible. All of the engines here in the city of Northampton are licensed at the paramedic level now. So not only are they trained as firefighters, but we have paramedics on there with paramedic gear that can actually start um, the advanced life support skills prior to the arrival of the ambulance. And then, um, now in addition to getting there quickly, the ability to have multiple people there, so someone who may be in cardiac arrest, you can have one person who can start the IV, one person who's getting their cardiac monitor set up, one person getting the medications going, um, usually happens on an upper floor, so um, between moving the patient, providing therapies for the patient, and then ultimately minimizing the potential for injuries for lifted new patients. Um, we've been very fortunate um, having the ability to send the engine to these calls. The, uh, the potential to minimize those potential back injuries has been huge. So that, that's a number of different reasons um, between the capabilities of the therapies, the response times, and the potential injuries, why an engine will go. And let me follow that. Uh, I'm often asked the question, it becomes more of a financial question than anything else. I mean, first of all, I believe that if we have people available, they should be actively engaged in doing whatever we can to help people. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that even gets me in trouble. But <clears throat> uh, beyond that, uh, if we did an analysis of what it costs to send a fire truck to that 25% of most severe calls in a year, it was about $4,000 a year. Before we did that, I can tell you about one back injury that cost the city over $255,000. So if we're spending $4,000 a year and it prevents a $250,000 injury to a person, forget even the cost, just the injury to the person, that is well worthwhile. And then build on top of that the benefit to patient care from both the fire and police side. Ed, what he's saying is actually true. When I was on the fire committee, if I can recall, when we had yeah, the families coming in about that incident, but also, too, as an example, on Pritzker Road, Tori, yep. where you live a little further down, past Rural Lane, one night, our fire department, our police department, and the fire trucks and the ambulances were there, we had an elderly woman whose house was on fire, and she almost died. Oh, wow. So, I mean, really, she was in bad shape. And she ended up, I think, at a rest home later on, and mm. a lot of support was there for this elderly person. That's good. From the police department and the fire department. They would even go and visit her at the, I think she was at a rest home somewhere, mm. right? Right. But she, she could have been dead. Oh. And she was in serious condition. So, if I see a fire truck and I see an ambulance and the police department, I don't think twice about it because I know why they're there and what the purpose is. Well, they should. And, and oh, I'm sorry. I have to say about the police department again and the fire department. I'm on board on West Stanton Road. I got a call from a neighbor of a resident. I'm very, very close to an elderly couple, and Patty, you know who they are. And the husband was not well. And the ambulance was called, okay, 911 number was called. I was actually there with the wife to keep her away from seeing what was happening. 
and he did expire. And I was asked by the police department and the ambulance department not to let her in the ambulance. I took her to the cooling deck because I knew she had expired and we waited for the person who comes down to talk with family. And it's like they have a tremendous amount of work that they have to do in our city. I support them. I support it for a brand new, anything they need from the fire department, yep. I always support it. And also the police department for the new police station. Yeah. So people really need to have to realize and see the visibility of what they actually do. I was just going to say that I am very thankful for the quick, prompt, immediate response when I called 911 when I got stuck in the elevator in my building. Oh, <laughs> oh I, um, I had to, I was stuck between floors. They had to break the door down and carry me out. And I have tremendous, and I think it was, I, I was kind of out of it because I was really scared, but I think it was the fire department who came. And I, I'm just very grateful that that help was there when I needed it. Good. Mike, maybe you have a question? Yeah, I just, this is kind of kicking it back to what we were talking about before. Um, kind of, uh, what is the time frame on a Section 12? And does a Section 12, for example, equal like an arrest warrant? I mean, do you, is it like you have to find the person? And how long does it expire ever? And is it the same level of intensity as an arrest warrant would be? Well, I would say that to me it has a higher <coughs> threshold than an arrest warrant because most of the arrest warrants aren't, aren't emergent. Right. You know, for, for many of them are not emergent. If, right. if somebody is deemed to be you know, a danger to themselves mm -hmm. that an act of that section 12, then yes, we're going to, we're going to make every effort to serve that. And we're going to go to any place we know the person to be. You know, we even put out lookouts for their vehicles. Um, so yes, we're 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 going to make every effort. As far as they expire, they do expire, and they expire every 24 hours. 24 hours. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's 24 hours, okay. and they do get renewed. If we we often we often get them renewed if we can find the person. Find the person. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Jim, you have a question? Um, yeah, I, the chief mentioned um, a while ago about there could be times where there's a shortage of um, ambulances in the city, and I, I know that if there was a fire, the communities, neighboring communities, help each other if they have the personnel to do that. Does that ever come up with a shortage of, of ambulance staff where having Amherst might be able to that you would work at would reach out to them and vice versa. Yeah, um, one of the questions I often get is how come each city and town has their own fire department? And, and realistically, in practice, it's a pretty seamless system that if, if you remember back to the night we had 19 arson fires in the city, there were 25 communities that came to help us. Uh, on a daily basis, we will go to East Hampton, we will, on a weekend basis especially, we go to Amherst, uh, and vice versa. Uh, I know there was a recent call right next to fire headquarters at the medical building in back, and it was an ambul Amherst ambulance that was at the hospital that was assigned to that call and transport because everything else was tied up. Uh, as Deputy Norris said, that's why we moved into getting the paramedic gear on the engines, because there are times, although infrequent, that an engine will show up because there is nothing else available now that paramedic can start therapy, which is really the emergency room coming to the patient. Uh, and we may wait for that mutual aid ambulance from East Hampton or from a private ambulance service in the city uh, to come and help us. Are there any other? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll say one more thing. Mm -hmm. Hannah, um, if you're talking about a specific person or a specific situation where there's some type of problem, I'm more than happy to address you know, individuals that, that think they're not getting proper service. I mean, they can contact me. I have, you know, as, as part of my job as a mental health liaison and in charge of our program, and I, I, you know, I have contacts in, at emergency service, at clinical and support options. I have contact at ServiceNet and the Department of Mental Health. So if, if there's something
somebody specific that we don't think is, you know, we could be doing something else with by all means. So I'm um, willing to address that individual situation to see if we can do a better job. Thank you. Thank you. Did someone Thank else you. have a question? And I'd just like to say, as we close out, I'd just like to thank Council Labart for the invite. I've, I've never been before this committee before, and, and it's good for both fire and police to get out and answer these questions. And yeah. I, I think we do better answering questions than doing presentations. We don't have to memorize them. We so. <laughs> have some members that are out six. So. Yeah. This was so helpful. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, really appreciate it. And um, it was really helpful information. I learned a lot. And I and I'll just say, as a lifelong resident of Northampton, and with a very high confidence level, I think, in the city, in police, and the fire, I think it's evident the, the departments really work well together, and we're fortunate, you know, because yeah. that's not always the case in other communities, so. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you recommended to us at one of our, our meetings by um, uh, Jeff um, Dugan from the Mass Office on Disability when he was here that the architect, and actually um, Louis Hasbrook said as well to talk with the um, director or representative from the Architectural Review Board because they would be able to tell us all the specifics and the the regulations, the state regulations about ADA ramps and all of that. I, th I you know, I support the concept, but I, I, that's about as far as I can go. Okay, so what you're saying is that um, what I would need to do next is um, get endorsement from the architectural access. And will that, see that, mm -hmm. I don't know if that would even do anything to the city. Well, uh, you know, I'm going to look at liability, I'm going to look at, um, you know, what, what kind of structure is ADA compliant and or approved by the architectural review, because one of the things I recall um, being said, including a phone call that I made to um, after the, you know this all became um, you know part of something that we were going to be involved with was that um, there are cases where it's not um, approved by the architectural um, access board. Okay. Yeah. Commission. No, that's 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 fine. Yeah, I, and I, I will I'll yeah. check with the architectural access. Right. And I had offered, if they're invited, that we could do it here. Mm -hmm. I would welcome being at the meeting. 
Um, I, I just really need more um, specific information about, you know, really what can we do or what can't we do. Because if we, you know, say, okay, we're going to um, support this or endorse it or whatever the terminology is that, you know, goes to city council, and then, then where does it go? And the, all those questions are going to come back to us, I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that we're moving, we're at the front when we really should be at the back to still get all this information. Councilor Also, um, I think our building inspector, Louie Hasbrook, did an excellent job explaining uh, procedures to start following on, and I agree with Patty and the system that she's talking about. I also would like to have the chief from the police department, Patty, be able to be involved here of what Michael is thinking about mm -hmm. doing. Does he approve the police department handling the funds and so forth? And I think that's very critical here mm -hmm. because it's just not going to come to city council. It's going to go to other committees also. So we have need to have everything in black and white. Yes, this person said yes, this can mm -hmm. be done, that can be done. There's many committees. So yeah, there it is. I, I, I guess I'm looking at it. I'm thinking I may just go Republican. I've got mine. You can get yours. I don't get that. Well, I've got, I mean, I have a little ramp that I can use. And, you know, so it's like Republican, I think. Republicans would say, I got mine. Good luck getting yours. Right. Like, you're all set, so I'm forgetting you guys. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to say that as the Commission on Disability, I would just like more information and and right. sort of move in a forward direction with it, not to keep it at a standstill, but that we're really prepared and gain um, and anybody okay. that we think should be brought into it so that we can say, right. here's, here's what should happen. Here's what Northampton can do. Here's what we want. Right. And also, with her, to include a couple of business owners in Northampton, I mean, I think for a fact, there probably would be an open public hearing for business owners mm -hmm. to be invited to. That'd be cool. So, just to clarify, um, what would the next step be for, for Michael and for me? What, what's, the next, what's the next thing that needs to happen? Yes. Yeah. What, what I would think is that we asked for a subcommittee, and Michael and Gain and Hannah is uh, on it, and I'm not sure who else you might have pulled into it. And us working in, you know, he, because you're both on the Commission on Disability, you know, we are represented at the table. And so what else do we need to do, or what else do you need to do, you meaning whoever, um, to, to move us forward with um, getting ramps in Northampton, these portable ramps. Right. Well, I think I'm, I think what I was thinking of is, is talk to the architectural Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I think that they have a lot of answers for us and yeah. would have that professional that. opinion <laughs> um, and, and see what they have to say. Okay. And I think from there, you know, things might move quicker. I think as Council LaBarge said, you know, um, talking with the police chief, the people who are going to be mm -hmm. part of this, you know, who's the, the network that we have to work with. Mm. But overall, I, it's, a, it's a wonderful concept, Michael. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good to have. Mm -hmm. it, it is. Because you're talking about it a long wanna, time. Right. And if you're going to do something, you don't want to do it wrong, you want to do it right. right. Yeah. So that way we have all the proof saying that this department, that department, they'll talk. They're all signed up. Exactly. Because yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. I think it can work, Michael. Yeah. I think it's a really great idea, and I don't want you to feel discouraged that it's taking a long time, because sometimes, um, like what people are saying, um, like what Mary Ann said, you want to do it right and make sure that it's really great. Look at the, for an example, the resolution on sidewalks, on vibrant sidewalks, one year and three months. Mm -hmm. 
and we're finally changing language on it because of the public hearings we had. Mm -hmm. And next month, it'll be all drafted and ready to go to the city council for the second reading. And progress can be slow. Yeah. Look at how long it took for the for the um, large print and Braille <coughs> excuse me, Braille yeah. and that's just like you know, within yeah. our committee. But look in general, mm -hmm. what what in life takes so long. Yeah. You know? And if you want to do it, Michael. You want to be proud of something that was done through the process and it was done correct. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. So um, let me know when um, you want this to be put back on the agenda for follow-up and for the next steps. I would like to ask the subcommittee, mm -hmm. have you had a meeting yet? Mm -hmm. Do you have? Yes. Yeah. And have other people on your organization that you're involved with been attending that? No, actually, we had a bad time on for people who work. So maybe have it in the evening or try try a different mm -hmm. time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And starting in uh, d uh, January again, the chorus is here on Tuesday nights. So that evening we would be open that you'd be able to have a meeting if you wanted to. You're yeah. usually here by seven o'clock. Okay. I'm sorry. You just that chorus. We have a course that um, uses our building on Tuesday nights, and they're oh, usually oh. here by 7. So oh, if you oh, wanted yeah. to have a meeting because people do work, then you could schedule that, but it would be a Tuesday night. A Tuesday night. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that sounds great. Okay. Do we have any other business or announcements? Yes. Yeah. Anna? Um, I noticed today um, there is no bench outside the post office. Um, there's no bench and there's no shelter outside the post office. Um, and I didn't know what happened to it. Is there going to be a new one put in place of the old one? I could comment on that. Okay. Um, there was a alleged drunk driver very recently, just over the weekend, a young woman. She drove into it. Oh, no. And oh. she destroyed it. Oh, no. And wow. um, I mean, she just. She had an accident. She failed the sobriety test. She'd been tr charged with operating under the influence of alcohol. And this literally just happened this past week. So it will be oh. taken care of. That's, and it was fortunate. It was right early in the morning. And so nobody was there. Oh. Because that is a busy stop. Yes. Yeah. And, and it, people could have been killed if it was during you know, wow. the Because that was in the paper. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, that will get back to yeah. that. We'll Okay, well that's good. Does anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Update on the benches. Have you talked with? No, I, yeah, I haven't talked to Ned Huntley about if the benches are in. I don't think Ned is handling that. Well, I, haven't talk, I haven't talked to anybody about okay. the benches. I'm just waiting for the phone call to say that they're in because I need to go measure the, um, the slats so that I know what size plaque to get mm. um, because different benches are different uh, slat sizes. Like we have benches out here and we have two different sizes. So once I see the bench and measure, then I'll know what size to get the plaque that we're going to put on um, as a gift from the Northern Commission. Do you have the size of the slats that go across? Because we didn't see the benches when we ordered uh, the catalog book. We ordered the plaques with it and it was put on it. Right. So Those my, benches. my question is, could Richard Pazzoletti possibly, if it's being ordered through him and they're taking care of it, know the size of those for you? Yeah, he, he could. That's so exciting. I can't wait to, to go sit on it. I can't wait to go sit on them. I'm going to be so happy. We could, have a, we, all we could have a meeting on Monday. I know. That's what we're going to do in the spring. Let's, in the spring, we'll have a meeting. We'll have to have the Gazette take a picture. Yeah. We should definitely do that. Yeah. Well, they did that with the um, shelter that was put up there with yep. the UTA. Right. I think we really should have the Gazette take a picture when the benches are. Yep. Okay, anything else? Or do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Seconded Second. by Colin? Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. All opposed? Sit here forever. <laughs> <laughs>